On Thursday, the House Oversight Committee held this hearing on mortgage foreclosures. Members heard from several bank executives about what they're doing to lower the foreclosure rate. This two-hour, 20-minute hearing is chaired by Congressman Adolphus Towns of New York. Committee will come to order. Good morning and thank you for coming. It took massive federal intervention using billions of taxpayers' dollars to save the banks from the edge of complete disaster. The banks and the financial system are now stabilizing. And in fact, the major banks are even beginning to make money again. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for millions of people who are unemployed or who are in danger of losing their homes. The threat of foreclosure is still at an all-time high. More than 3.1 million Americans are delinquent on their mortgage by 60 days or more. A letter from the bank or a phone call from the mortgage company is still keeping many homeowners awake at night, agonizing over the potential loss of their home. For these people, the economic crisis is far from over. As I have said before, to its great credit, the Obama administration recognized early on that an important part of the nation's economic recovery is keeping as many people as possible in their homes. This makes sense from both an economic standpoint and a public policy standpoint, and I salute him for that. The Home Affordable Modification Program, better known as HAMP, is a central piece of the Treasury Department's effort to carry out that objective. HAMP had a troubled start, but it appears that some significant improvements have recently been made. More than 1.2 million homeowners have now started a HAMP trial modification, and 346,000 have obtained a permanent modification. The median savings to, those, to these homeowners is a little over $500 per month. Moreover, the number of permanent modifications has more than doubled in the last, last three months. But there are still major problems with HAMP. The chief complaint is the slow pace at which servicers are permanently modifying trouble mortgages. There is still considerable concerns over confusing and conflicting communications from loan services or, and, and borrowers. And while more permanent modifications are being made, fewer delinquent borrowers appear to be qualifying for HAMP. Perhaps most important, many of the borrowers who obtain a trial modification drop out of the program later. In fact, it appears that a majority of the mortgage modifications obtained on the HAMP may not be successful. A separate and deeply troubling issue is raised by a new study by the Center for Responsible Lending, which found that minority communities continue to experience significantly higher foreclosure rates than whites, regardless of their income levels. This confirms similar findings reported by the National Community Reinvestment Coalition in the committee's last hearing of HAMP. Today, I would like to hear from the banks exactly how this disparity can be addressed. Clearly, we need to do a lot better than we've done in the past. But this is not just about HAMP. I think the mortgage banking industry has got to recognize that HAMP cannot be the only solution to the foreclosure crisis. Some of the banks appearing today have begun to save homes from foreclosures with principal reductions, second lien modifications, and other help for the unemployed. These sound like good first steps, but I want to hear more. 
and I want to see broad participation throughout the mortgage loan industry. Foreclosure is a losing proposition for everyone involved if you stop and you analyze it. The homeowners loses a house, the bank loses a big chunk of its investment, and the community loses a family with a stake in the community. What I'm asking the banks to do is to help us find an effective way to stop these foreclosures. I want to thank our witnesses today and I, for appearing, and I look forward for your testimony. I will now yield five minutes to uh, the uh, committee ranking member, but let me just say this before we move any further, that we're going to give five additional minutes on each side. Um, of course, um, after your opening statement, we'll give five minutes on the Democratic side and five minutes on the uh, Republican side, and that could be split up five ways, six ways, in many ways that you want to split it up, thank but you have five minutes. Right. Okay. Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding today's hearing to examine the continuing failure of this administration's response to the foreclosure crisis. At the outset, I must express my extreme disappointment that the committee will not hear from the Treasury Department today. Since the committee's last hearing on HAMP three months ago, Treasury has continued its pattern of secrecy, dishonesty, and failure. Treasury has refused to implement the Special Inspector General's recommendations for reform of the program. It continues to misrepresent the original goals of the program so as to disguise its ineffectiveness. And most importantly, the Obama administration's technocratic tinkering in the housing markets has continued to fail the American people. Just this week, we learned that Treasury has kicked substantially more people out of the HAMP program than have received sustainable mortgage modifications. As the Wall Street Journal recently reported, many of these Americans are actually worse off for relying on the administration's promises. I look forward to hearing from the mortgage servicers here today. They play a vital role in the process, and their perspective is necessary and helpful in examining this federal program. But inviting the implementers of the program while ignoring the designers of the program and the people ultimately responsible for the waste of $75 billion of taxpayer money is simply a failure of oversight. I'm also disappointed, Mr. Chairman, that GAO was disinvited from today's hearing. GAO has been investigating HAMP on an ongoing basis, and they published a report this morning focused on the performance of mortgage servicers to coincide with their expected testimony at this particular hearing. Their perspective would also have been valuable for this committee to hear. Mr. Chairman, I respectfully urge you to invite the Treasury Department to answer for its failures at another hearing in the near future. We have a joint responsibility to the American people to hold this administration accountable regardless of political affiliations. The services, uh, servicers we hear from today have worked to comply with 800 HAMP rules issued in over 15 different set of guidelines. Not surprisingly, they have been able to offer far more mortgage modifications privately outside of HAMP than within it. Ultimately, however, the best mortgage modification is a job. And unfortunately, this Congress and this administration has stifled private sector job creation through their big government anti-economic growth agenda. The implications of these policy mistakes are being felt by former home, uh, homeowners across this great country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman for his statement, but let me just indicate to you that we did have Treasury in, we did have GAO, and uh, we had SIGTARP, and of course, you know, you can't do but so much in one day. GAO right. study was out this, yeah. came, came out this morning, Mr. Chairman. That's right. what we need to hear about. Uh, gentleman from Maryland. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I'm concerned about the claims. First of all, thank you for holding the hearing. And I'm concerned about the claims published in the uh, Washington Post this past Monday that a growing number of borrowers are failing to move from the HAMP program's initial stage into a permanent loan modification. More than 100,000 borrowers lost their mortgage aid in May. About half of those dropped from the federal program received another type of loan modification from their banks, according to the government data. But housing counselors have complained that those alternative loan modifications are typically not as generous as what the government <clears throat> program offers and often come with uh, hefty upfront fees. I'm interested to, <clears throat> to see how these options have been communicated with the borrowers. Getting started and understanding the process can be one of the toughest steps in the long loan modification efforts. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, for the, over the last 15 months, uh, I've held four foreclosure prevention workshops in my district 
And I can tell you that the, the, the key is that we have to have effective and efficient programs. Uh, it's one thing to talk about them. It's another thing to actually carry them out. And uh, hopefully the people uh, who are testifying before us today uh, can help us get better insight as to how we can keep people in their homes. I've told my constituents that they must protect their house. House is their number one investment in most instances uh, and a very, very important investment. And I think that we need to be doing more and more to help people retain their homes so that they can have the stability and so that we can keep, uh, so they can keep their families stable and also, of course, so that we can keep neighborhoods stable. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize um, Mr. Turner. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Recognize. Could, could you Mr. clarify Chairman. for us how the how the time is? Are, are you saying that that there's five, Mr. Chairman? Are you saying that there's five minutes over there and there's five minutes yeah, over here? Yeah. Actually, yield. Yeah, he yield back. So we we still have uh, three minutes left on this side. Okay. All right. So great. we now you have your okay. entire five minutes on this side. Well, and then I want to pass it then. Okay. Great. Um, well, Mr. Chairman, you, you said, um, as you know, you acknowledged the request um, by um, the ranking member for a representative from Treasury, and you said, you know, we can only do so much in one day. I can tell you that we'd come back. I mean, we're, we're a hard-working committee, and everybody would. The be gentleman, glad you to for a here. second. We've had Treasury. You act as if we did not. You have haven't treasury, had them but... since Monday when they had their report issued that says that this program is failing, and and I've got some very serious questions. You know, just yesterday. Just yesterday, the Treasury Secretary appeared before the Congressional Oversight Panel where he was asked a question about HAMP, and do you know what he said? He said this program was not designed to prevent foreclosures. It was not designed to sustain home ownership at a level that would be unachievable, imprudent to try to do. He goes on to say, when someone asks him, well, what, you know, do you think it should go to 65 percent of home ownership level? He says, I think you're describing exactly the objectives that have shaped this program. The chair of the Congressional Oversight Panel responding to his comment said this, I was very surprised and very frustrated by the notion that the secretary seemed to be saying that a program that helps only a tiny handful of families facing foreclosures is a successful program because in effect, the rest deserve to lose their homes. She says, I thought that was shocking. I find it shocking. I, I find it inconsistent with the chairman's opening statement about what this program is to, to do. And, you know, certainly Secretary Geithner is responsible for ensuring the success of the program. I also find it inconsistent with what the President told the American people this, this program was going to do. Now, now we, have, we have an absolute crisis, and it is not over. I mean, I'm, I'm from Montgomery County, Ohio, and the foreclosure rate is staggering in my community. Ohio has seen the, the foreclosures continue to mount, and, and clearly this needs to be addressed not only by Treasury addressing this program and giving people real answers as to its goals and objectives, but also for the financial institutions, because we cannot lose focus here that the financial institutions got us in this mess. This is not a government-created mess. By their lending practices that did not make sense, that were not sound business decisions, that did not protect the banks, and did not protect capital investments. And the concern that I have as I look to Treasury and then to the financial institutions is that decisions are being made currently that don't protect capital. Every member of Congress can tell you that the realtors in their communities tell them that it is virtually impossible to get lo loan servicers, banks, or financial institutions to work with a home buyer, to get a short sale to do things that would avoid foreclosure. Now, this is what I don't understand, and I'm looking forward to some information to today. The test under the HAMP program is supposed to preserve capital for the banks, but apparently it's not a program that even the banks are, are with zeal um, pursuing. And then when you look at, at, at the market, any time that we can afford, that we can avoid foreclosure, you make more, you've preserved your capital, the market sustains more because once a home goes into foreclosure, prices in, in a neighborhood drop, and families are sustained. So I'm interested today in why isn't this program working, why isn't Treasury here, but also from you guys. Why aren't you operating in what we would all believe a market standard of capital preservation because we are continuing to proceed toward foreclosure at rates where we all know people are approaching the financial institutions with deals and offers that are being rejected that would have a higher return than foreclosure does? I'm interested in, in, in some of those answers today.
Gentlemen, you're back? I go back. Yeah. I now recognize um, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And let me just say uh, you have three minutes. For one, I'm going to I'm going to take one minute if you let me know when that's done. Um, we know that the state of Ohio received another 172 million dollars so that people could be counseling individuals on how to stay in their home, and I'm I'm grateful for the administration of that. But we also know that servicers have been referring eligible borrowers to foreclosure until they've been evaluated for HAMP. Uh, Treasury had to intervene to try to put a stop to that practice. Uh, we know that Bank of America has 13% uh, uh, permanent modifications, J.P. Morgan Chase 20%, uh, Wells Fargo 22%, City Mortgage 23%, American Home Mortgage servicing 16%. This whole program is about keeping people in their homes, and yet we're finding that uh, th the servicers uh, apparently are not uh, stepping up in a way that uh, can encourage more and more people to stay in. We know that uh, people are not given reasons, uh, uh, understandable reasons, why their uh, home affordable mortgage uh, modification program is denied, uh, that it's sketchy as to what how people appeal a denial, uh, that, uh, and to have their denials reviewed before they face foreclosure. I mean, these are all things that this hearing is going to get into. Uh, but you know, we're glad you're doing what you're doing, but it's not enough. Gentlemen, you know, one minute is up. Thank you. Yeah. Gentleman from um, Virginia, we ha he has two minutes left. I thank the chairman. Uh, I just want to say I, I appreciate uh, the uh, steadfastness of our friends on the other side of the aisle and wanted to look at a program and make sure it's better uh, and, uh, and working. Uh, but I think it's important to remember that uh, our friends on the other side of the aisle are the same ones that stood by and uh, allowed for no or loose regulation that created the subprime mortgage bubble in the first place. And to a person, they opposed helping anybody who was underwater or threaten, threatened with foreclosure, including in Ohio. Uh, uh, not one person in America would have been helped if their vote had actually been the majority vote when we looked at the Recovery and Reinvestment Act. So when we're looking at the subject and we're looking at well, imperfect well, the models that are not well, succeeding, well, the I will yield. not yield, well, uh, that are yield. Not, I will not yield, I, that are not succeeding to the fullest extent, let's remember that there are some among us who would have helped not at all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from uh, North Carolina has, what, two minutes? One minute. One minute. The gentleman from North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just uh, say to the Chairman that uh, my colleague on the left uh, is, is flat wrong. What he's saying is actually not the case. We want a workable program that will actually help homeowners not a failed program that is expensive to the taxpayers and doesn't actually help home homeowners. It's been an absolute failure. GAO reports report after report. If we talk to folks in our communities and our districts, they'll tell you it's not working. And I've been, I've been front and center on this issue trying to help homeowners at home and here in Washington with policies. And it was the party over there that would do nothing about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac which really added fuel to the fire of subprime and this mortgage crisis that we're inheriting and that we're trying to work through right now. So rather than this guy blaming Bush, let's move forward. Let's try to do something reasonable for homeowners. They're sick and tired of this kind of petty politics. We want to fix this problem, not simply throw some money at it. We want a workable solution, uh, not some empty rhetoric. And so with that, um, be happy to yield back or yeah, yield to my colleague. The no, gentleman's time has expired. Thank you. But let me just say to all of the members of the committee, there's enough blame to go around. I mean, I want you to know that that's, um, uh, and we've just sort of put things in the proper context. We've had the Treasury Department, GAO, and the SIGTARP to testify at our first hearing on this issue. Treasury was questioned by the committee for more than three hours on the performance of HAMP at the first hearing. And now it's the bank's turn, and we are going to hear from them today. But more importantly, let me state, HAMP is not the only way to address the foreclosure problem. HAMP is just a part of 
the solution, but not the whole solution. Uh, we need the wholehearted cooperation of everybody across the board, even this committee. On that note, I see no recognition. We had a minute left on that side. So uh, we, yes, uh, one minute from Cong the gentlewoman from California. Ms. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think the American homeowners who are grieving right now and pleading for some kind of modification don't care if it's HAMP or something organized by the bank. They just want some relief. And I think it's shameful that um, my colleagues feel compelled to point fingers one way or the other. The one issue that is really critical that we have to look at is the conflict of interest that exists where there is a mortgage and a second mortgage and the servicer has an interest in the second mortgage and therefore will not negotiate uh, a, a modification with the first mortgage. That's a really serious issue and one that we should address here today. I yield back. All time has now expired. Um, we will turn to our panel of witnesses. Uh, it is committee policy that all witnesses are sworn in. If you would stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Yes. Right, you may be seated. Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Mr. Doss is the Chief Executive Officer of City Mortgage, Inc. Welcome, Mr. Doss. Uh, Ms. Barbara DeSore is the President of Bank of America Home Loans, which is the nation's largest home mortgage servicer. Welcome, Mrs. DeSore. Mr. David Friedman is the President and Chief Executive Officer of American Home Mortgage Servicing, which is the nation's largest independent non-prime servicer. Welcome, Mr. Friedman. Mr. David Lowman, I'm sorry, no, Mr. Hyde, is the co-president of Wells Fargo Home Mortgage, which services one out of every six mortgage loans in the nation. Welcome, Mr. Hyde. And Mr. David Lowman, Mr. Lowman is the chief executive officer of Chase Home Finance. Uh, welcome, Mr. Lowman. And Mr. Edward Pinto is a real estate financial servicer consultant. Welcome and delighted to have you here as well. At this time, I would ask the witnesses to deliver their statement. And let me just explain, just in case, um, you know, in terms of how it works, there's a light that comes on and it's green, and then it's uh, uh, at, after four minutes, it becomes you know, uh, you know, caution, and then uh, it turns red. Now, red means stop. So I just want to just sort of uh, remind you of how it works. So we got that straight. So Mr. Doss, why don't we start with you and come right down the line. Mm -hmm. And this will allow us an opportunity to raise questions. Thank you. Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Isa, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss City's efforts to help families stay in their homes and describe our progress in implementing the Home Affordable Mortgage Program Modification Program, HAMP. I am Sanjeev Das, CEO of City Mortgage, and I'm honored to be speaking with you today. As City CEO Vikram Pandit has said, we owe a debt of gratitude to the American taxpayer and our government for providing city with top funds. We believe it is our responsibility to help American families in financial distress, and in particular, to help families stay in their homes. As one recent example, just last week, City became the first major lender to announce a 90-day moratorium on mortgage foreclosures in the Gulf Coast region. Our goal is to help families who've been hard hit by the devastating oil spill to remain in their homes. At City, we are focused on two key priorities. Working hard to make the HAM program as successful as possible, and providing solutions for distressed borrowers that do not qualify for or have fallen out of the HAM process. Our focus has produced significant results. City is consistently ranked among the top performing servicers 
and since 2007, we have assisted more than 900,000 families in their efforts to avoid foreclosure. We know that the HAMP process can be somewhat complicated, and so we have strived to make it easier for our customers. We have hired special staffers to focus solely on the HAMP process and given them detailed training. In addition, we have added more than 1,400 new employees to support our foreclosure prevention efforts. We have invested in our HAMP processing systems so that HAMP applicants can now view their application status and documents online. Customers are also notified electronically when they meet key milestones in the application process. We have learned that borrowers can be reluctant to work directly with services, so we increasingly work with third parties in local communities on mortgage modification outreach. We've also partnered with Hope Now to conduct document collection events in face-to-face -face meetings with borrowers who need help. Our goal is to give every, every distressed borrower the opportunity to reach us for assistance. We have designed and implemented procedures to ensure the fair application of HAMP standards for all applicants. Despite these initiatives, challenges remain. For example, HAMP has been revised multiple times since March 2009. With each change, additional training and systems are required, which in turn impact program efficiencies. Further, factors beyond our control often prohibit customers from moving from a trial modification to a permanent HAMP modification. In the majority of these cases, the required documents are not submitted, required payment, trial payments are not made, or the borrower is ineligible for the program. And since the HAM program does not fit every distressed borrower's needs, City is providing solutions that helps borrowers who do not qualify for the HAM process or who have not achieved HAM modifications. As part of this effort, we offer a number of supplemental modification programs that are designed to address customer needs on a case-by-case -case basis. These solutions are tailored to a homeowner's unique circumstances and deliver an outcome that is affordable and lasting. City's own proprietary programs assist customers with a variety of solutions addressing challenges such as unemployment and imminent risk of default and utilizing a variety of strategies to solve for affordability of payments. These solutions are described in the appendix attached to this testimony in more detail. We believe the issue of affordability is the most important consideration in modifications. We do not believe there is a one-size-fits-all approach to affordability. The proof of this is in our low re-default rates, which continue to be significantly below industry averages. For those borrowers who face severe hardship, City introduced dedicated short sale and deed in lieu teams in 2009, which offer a number of customizable solutions. And will participate in the 2MP program when it becomes available this summer. These programs enable borrowers to avoid foreclosure and allow for a dignified transition to the next phase of their lives. I understand there's much more work to be done. City remains focused on achieve, achieving affordability and we support the Treasury's programs to help consumers. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before this committee. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. DeSueur. Uh, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, and members of the committee, thank you for holding a hearing on this very important issue. Since January 2008, Bank of America has completed more than 630,000 loan modifications. We continue to innovate, first with our own proprietary loan modification programs, and more recently with the adoption of 2MP and our own principal forgiveness program. With the acquisition of Countrywide in 2008, July, Bank of America's servicing portfolio changed dramatically, both in loan type and in volume, more than tripling to nearly 14 million customer loans. We've undertaken a massive retooling of the servicing organization to address the needs of distressed homeowners. We've built a new default management capability, new processes, new technology, and a 60 percent increasing in uh, increase in staffing to more than 18,000. Bank of America has participated in more than 360 community outreach events, opened assistance centers for in-person counseling, and gone door-to-door -to, -door to help customers understand their options. 
We're also participating in the Hope Now Loan Portal so housing counselors can directly submit completed customer applications. There have definitely been rough spots and customers have experienced service that is very inconsistent with our standards. We continue to learn and improve as we work through these difficult times, never losing sight of the impact that foreclosure has on the individual or the community. Since HAMP launched in March of 2009, Bank of America has built momentum in the program. For the past three months, we have led servicers in the number of completed modifications. Bank of America also became the first major loan servicer to begin implementing the second Treasury's second lien program on April 1st. We took this step to provide customers a more affordable combined monthly mortgage payment. This March, we announced an industry-leading principal reduction program for qualifying customers who owe significantly more than their homes are worth. We began mailing offers May 17th to provide immediate relief to those in the most imminent danger of foreclosure. Treasury also announced a similar principal reduction program that will be effective later this year, and we're working to align our own program with theirs. As we execute and evaluate programs that can expand HAMP's reach, it's vital to understand the current eligibility of delinquent customers. Many customers do not and will not qualify for HAMP. Within Bank of America's servicing portfolio, 1.4 million first mortgage customers are more than 60 days delinquent on their mortgage payment. Of those customers, Treasury estimates that about 478,000 are potentially eligible for a modification through HAMP. As of the end of May, Bank of America has mailed more than a million solicitations made trial offers to over 400,000 customers, started active trials with more than 300,000 customers, and we have 70,000 permanent modifications under HAMP. As our results demonstrate, HAMP has been largely successful in making offers to customers. However, getting customers to accept the offers and complete the requirements to obtain a permanent modification has been a challenge. In April, Bank of America began HAMP process changes that will require income and other documentation up front before the trial period is started, and we believe these changes will improve the trial to permanent conversion rate. Still, given the depth and length of the recession, a considerable number of customers will not be able to afford to stay in their home. <clears throat> in these cases, we invite customers to consider short sales or deeds in lieu programs to support a dignified transition from home ownership to alternative housing. We inform customers about these options as part of the HAMP decline process. For customers who have not met the requirements of the trial period, they receive letters that clearly state the reason for ineligibility. More than 40 percent of the declines we've mailed are because of missed payments in the trial period. Bank of America provides a dedicated toll-free number for customers to appeal the decision, provide updated financial information, or discuss other options. We will not complete a foreclosure sale until the appeal period has expired. Innovative solutions have, helped create, have been created to help customers sustain home ownership, and Bank of America is committed to executing those programs well. All of us at Bank of America, including the thousands of associates who work on these efforts, issues every day take seriously our role in helping customers through this difficult cycle. Thank you, and I'll be pleased to take questions. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Friedman. Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Isa, and members of the committee, we at American Home appreciate the committee's consideration of the complex issues surrounding the efforts of servicers to implement HAMP. American Home Mortgage Servicing, or AMSA, is a non-prime residential loan servicer that does not own, originate, nor have any interest in any of the loans that we service. Our focus is on keeping borrowers in their homes while balancing our obligation to provide continued cash flows to investors. Contrary to popular opinion, servicers do not make money on foreclosures. They benefit no one and undertaken only as a last resort when other foreclosure solutions are not available. We aggressively pursue any reasonable modification opportunity in the best interest 
of the investor through early intervention. All troubled loans are routinely reviewed for HAMP or other loss mitigation workout consideration. Although we already have made thorough solicitation efforts of our portfolio, we are again in the process of resoliciting every borrower potential for that has potential for HAMP eligibility. To assist borrowers in avoiding foreclosure, we have, among other things, established a dedicated team of housing counselors and trained our call center associates as to loss mitigation opportunities. We have invested in the development of improved proprietary information systems, built relationships with housing agencies, counseling agencies, and housing alliances, participated extensively in outreach events, considered borrowers for proprietary modifications in, in situations <clears throat> where we are unable to offer a HAMP modification, and we have offered other foreclosure alternative solutions whenever a modification is not appropriate. Several barriers remain despite significant progress by the industry in the implementation of HAMP. Even with relaxed standards, the required underwriting documents are too burdensome. Many borrowers are unable to provide these documents or simply choose not to do so. Servicers such as OMSI who experience redefault rates that are significantly less than industry averages should be allowed to rely upon their proven, less stringent underwriting requirements. Many borrowers delay in responding to standard HAMP solicitations and others are confused by program enhancements that are prematurely announced. Frequent program changes have overtaxed servicer systems and processes, and the newly announced HAMP principal reduction program has increased the number of so-called strategic defaulters, otherwise able borrowers who purposely stop paying on their mortgages to seek HAMP assistance. By failing to emphasize the necessity of a valid hardship, HAMP does not discourage this type of behavior. The HAMP program has experienced significant issues in converting trial period plans to permanent <laughs> modifications. Many borrowers failed to make the required trial payments and now are permanently ineligible for HAMP. Many others failed to timely return executed modification agreements despite our extensive efforts to collect those documents. Deficiencies in and complexities of the HAMP reporting system, IR2, have made it difficult to officially report many permanent modifications. Not all borrowers qualify for a HAMP modification. The top three factors for denials are the property is not the borrower's primary residence, the applicable securitization servicing documents restrict or prohibit modifications, and the borrower failed to provide a complete underwriting package. OMSI has established an appeal process for HAMP denials and an independent team reviews and confirms denials. Borrowers that do not qualify for a HAMP mod are reviewed to determine if other proprietary home retention options will prevent foreclosure. We maintain a robust complaint tracking and resolution process that is dedicated to handling all borrower complaints we take our responsibilities under the HAMP program seriously. We've been audited by MHA compliance twice. Each time there were no major findings or enforcement actions. HAMP compliance often imposes unnecessarily complex burdens on servicers that divert resources away from more productive customer-facing activities. While performance is improving, challenges persist even as the program matures. In conclusion, OMSI is firmly committed to HAMP and to its goals and standards. We are anxious to see the program succeed and look forward to working with the Treasury and Congress to implement any needed improvements. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Friedman. Mr. Hyatt. Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, and members of the committee, I'm Mike Hyde, Co-President of Wells Fargo Home Mortgage. Thank you for the opportunity to share the results Wells Fargo has achieved in assisting homeowners across America. Because of the product choices we've made, our disciplined underwriting, and the manner in which we approach foreclosure prevention, our delinquency and foreclosure rates in the first quarter of 2010 were three-fourths the industry average, and on an annual basis, less than 2 percent of our owner-occupied servicing portfolio has gone to foreclosure sale. 
To begin with just a few examples of the actions we have undertaken to achieve these results, since January 2009 through May of 2010, we have helped more than 2.2 million homeowners with new low-rate loans, either to purchase a home or refinance their existing mortgage. We have assisted about a half million loan customers with trial or completed modifications, about one-fifth of which are through the HAMP program. We have assisted more than 100,000 unemployed customers with short-term modifications. Starting in January of 2009, several months before the creation of HAMP, we led the industry by permanently forgiving more than $3 billion in principal for more than 55,000 customers, which amounts to more than $50,000 per loan. We have begun offering home payment relief to customers affected by the oil spill in the Gulf Coast. With respect to our loan modification efforts, while very difficult to achieve, we believe we must continue to balance the needs and interests of homeowners in financial distress with those who have remained diligent in making their mortgage payments. While much focus deservedly is directed to those consumers behind on their payments, we cannot lose sight of the fact that about 92 percent of Wells Fargo's mortgage customers are current in their home payments as of the first quarter of 2010. HAMP is a good option for people who meet certain criteria, but it's only part of the home retention story. By the Treasury Department's own April 2010 estimates for Wells Fargo, only three of every ten customers, 60 or more days past due on their home payments, are potential candidates for HAMP. As a result, servicers and investors have additional programs for the vast number of customers who are not eligible or likely will not qualify for HAMP. Taking all of these programs into account, about two-thirds of Wells Fargo's customers more than 60 days behind on their home payments are provided an option to prevent foreclosure. Finally, with the benefit of hindsight, it is clear the industry was not prepared for the significant number of customers that would face financial hardships as the economy continued to become more challenging. Wells Fargo is not always consistent in providing the level of service we expect to deliver our customers. But over the past year, we have committed tremendous resources and believe we have come a long way in providing and improving our service. For example, we have hired more than 10,000 people for a total of 17,800 U.S.-based home preservation jobs. By the end of this month, we will complete the process of assigning one person to manage one loan modification from beginning to end. In other words, our customers will know exactly who they are working with from start to finish. We continue our work with other industry participants to accelerate the credit decision process, setting a five-day decision target once all documents are in hand, as compared to the HAMP standard of 30 days. We have invested in improvements in workflow systems and document imaging. We have participated in more than 300 home preservation events, including 10 large-scale events solely for our customers, and established 27 home preservation centers in six states where we have concentrations of at-risk customers. We now give Wells Fargo Home Mortgage Loan customers a short sale decision in 5 to 15 days, and we continue to have a dedicated phone line for your staff to use in the event one of your constituents, our customer, has an issue that needs resolution. In conclusion, Wells Fargo will continue to lead the industry in further improving methods and programs to assist homeowners. We believe very strongly and feel very deeply about our responsibility to help homeowners in a balanced and fair way. And we believe our actions demonstrate our commitment to achieving this goal. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, Mr. Hyde. Mr. Lohman. Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. My name is Dave Lohman, and I am the Chief Executive Officer of Home Lending at J.P. Morgan Chase. J.P. Morgan Chase shares your commitment to helping homeowners and stabilizing our nation's housing market. At Chase, we are working hard to help families meet their mortgage obligations and keep them in their homes by making their payments affordable. To date, we have helped prevent hundreds of thousands of foreclosures through our own proprietary modification programs, HAMP, and other agency programs. In addition, we have refinanced nearly $21 billion of loans under HARP. HAMP modification performance has been strong. At Chase, we are now completing more than 10,000 permanent modifications per month. On average, homeowners are seeing their monthly payments reduced by more than $530, an average payment reduction of 28 percent. We are also adopting and implementing the Federal Government's Foreclosure Alternative Program and Second Lien Modification Program to help more borrowers. We actively use temporary forbearance agreements for unemployed borrowers, similar to the program recently announced by the Administration. You have asked us to focus our testimony on how we can make foreclosure prevention initiatives, including HAMP, 
more effective for borrowers. From the beginning of 2009 through the end of May 2010, Chase offered almost 850,000 modifications to struggling homeowners and made 172,000 of these modifications permanent under HAMP and other programs. HAMP is one of the tools we use to help these borrowers. Chase has offered HAMP trials to nearly 260,000 borrowers. Of these, 88,000 are in active HAMP trials and 48,000 have converted to permanent modifications. Our experience has demonstrated that HAMP loans with a meaningful reduction in monthly payment perform very well. In particular, once borrowers have successfully completed the three-month three trial period, the loans redefault less frequently than we or Treasury predicted, even where the loan was previously delinquent or has a high loan-to-value ratio. We conduct extensive outreach and have made significant investments in people, technology, and infrastructure. In response to our customers' needs, we have developed more creative approaches to reach borrowers in ways that work for them. We've opened 51 Chase Home Ownership Centers in 15 states and the District of Columbia, where 88,000 borrowers have met face-to-face -face with our trained counselors. On top of these efforts, we have also launched a national outreach tour of the nine cities where our customers need the most help. Events on the tour last four to five days and are staffed over the weekend, 12 hours a day, where we can help borrowers find solutions to the full range of challenges they face with their mortgages. The customer response to these events has been very positive. In total, nearly half of our entire staff in Chase are dedicated to helping homeowners. 7,600 of them are loan counselors who deal only with loan modifications for borrowers in financial difficulty. There are several challenges in implementing HAMP. The biggest challenge is that HAMP was designed to help a specific population of borrowers. As illustrated in the Department of Treasury's recent report, only one-third of borrowers who are 60 days or more past due are expected to be eligible for HAMP. Now that income and other documentation are required upfront and we are no longer relying, relying on stated income, we expect that the conversion rate from trial to permanent mod to increase substantially. Going forward, failure to make the required payment should be the primary reason that someone does not convert from a trial plan to a permanent modification. Another challenge has been HAMP's continuing evolution. There are good reasons for the number of changes, but nonetheless, we've had to adjust our systems and retrain our people as the program evolves. The evolution of the program has expanded the opportunities to keep people in their homes. We do not want to miss an opportunity to help a borrower stay in their home, so we individually review each case and will extend the trial period where needed in cases where we think the borrower is likely to qualify for a permanent modification. It's also important to note that where borrowers are making their payments in HAMP trial modifications but may, ultimately, may not ultimately qualify for a permanent HAMP modification, we believe we are able to qualify those borrowers for other modification programs. Now let me touch on fair lending. Similar to our loan origination business, Chase is committed to full compliance with the letter and spirit of all fair lending laws and seeks to make available foreclosure prevention solutions to all borrowers regardless of race, national origin, religion, age, gender, or any other prohibited bias. We are pleased to have this opportunity to share our progress with you. We look forward to continuing to work with members of Congress, the administration, our banking regulators, and our community leaders in implementing these initiatives to help families and to stabilize neighborhoods and the U.S. economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lohman. Um, Mr. Pinto. Chairman Towns and Ranking Member Issa, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. In discussing HAMP, it's useful to recall its original goals. Those were to help as many as three to four million financially struggling homeowners avoid foreclosure by modifying loans to a level that is affordable for borrowers now and sustainable over the long term. Second, to provide clear and consistent loan modification guidelines. Third, to determine a borrower's up eligibility up front. Last February, I testified before the Domestic Policy Subcommittee of this committee and advised that rather than avoiding three to four million foreclosures, HAMP at that juncture would likely help just 250,000 homeowners stay in their homes without default. As I will explain, it appears that my estimate from February was pretty close to the mark. The success rate is so low due to government initiatives mandating looser underwriting standards dating back to the early 1990s. It is this legacy of government mandates for weak loans 
that makes it so difficult to achieve successful modifications. A high default rate also works to keep HAMP's total successful modifications low. I expect a 40 percent that 40 percent of permanent modifications will redefault. Treasury promised clear and consistent loan modification guidelines. There are only two words to describe HAMP's guidelines, numbing complexity. At last count, HAMP had 800 requirements and services are expected to certify compliance. Treasury also promised that a borrower's eligibility would be determined up front. As was recently observed in the Wall Street Journal, quote, eager for results, the Obama administration last year prodded banks to start people on trials without first obtaining documents proving they were eligible. <clears throat> that has led to many crushed hopes, close quote. Instead of a quick yes or no, homeowners were placed in trial modification limbo. Back in February, I indicated that HAMP's January pipeline would likely yield only 250,000 homeowners who would ulti ultimately avoid foreclosure under HAMP, only about 6 to 8 percent of the announced goal. HAMP activity has slowed markedly in the last few months, with the number of new trial modifications declining by two-thirds between December 2009 and May 2010. The number of new permanent modifications last month was 30 percent below April's. As of May 31, 2010, there were 340,000 active permanent modifications. Assuming a 40 percent default rate, only 200,000 of these permanent modifications will likely be successful over the short term, excuse me, over the long term. There are another 468,000 active trial modifications. Of these, perhaps only 75,000 will become successful long-term permanent modifications. Discounting all the spin, the current HAMP pipeline will yield about 275,000 successful long-term permanent modifications, with perhaps another 100,000 uh, successes resulting from future trial modifications. Treasury's many missteps with HAMP has had other repercussions. It encouraged strategic defaults. Homeowners who are willing to default when the value of the mortgage exceeds the value of their home, even if they can afford to pay off their mortgage. Researchers at the University of Chicago and Northwestern University found that the percentage of foreclosures that were perceived to be strategic was 31 percent in March 2010, and that's up dramatically from the 22 percent in March 2009 when HAMP started. With more and more borrowers believing that lenders are failing to pursue those who default on their mortgages, there is a risk that a growing number of borrowers will walk away from their homes even if they can afford the monthly payment. HAMP has slowed down the foreclosure process, pushing the period of heightened foreclosure activity out to 2013 or 2014, and likely extending the time until the market corrects. But perhaps HAMP's greatest shortcoming is that it derailed burgeoning efforts of the private sector to effectively modify loans. The, fact are, the facts are in the Office of uh, Control of the Currency Mortgage Metrics Report uh, that's produced quarterly. Uh, there are three charts. Chart one demonstrates that the private sector uh, had been rapidly ramping up its modification efforts in 2008 and 2009, and it was when HAMP started that uh, those efforts were derailed. Uh, chart two indicates that the uh, private sector was having greater and greater success with the uh, re uh, reducing the redefault rate on loans that were being done outside the HAMP program, and chart three demonstrates the slowdown and effective wind down of the HAMP program as new trial uh, modifications have uh, fallen off precipitously and now the number of permanent mods has also started dropping. The committee should ask the Treasury Department where are the modifications that but for HAMP the private sector was on track to produce. This committee and the pe American people deserve an honest assessment as to HAMP's future. Thank you and I'd be happy to answer questions at the appropriate time. Thank you very much. Let me begin by thanking all of you um, for your uh, testimony. Um, I guess the question is, you know, why haven't there been more permanent mortgage modifications? I mean, what is the problem? I mean, uh, and just quickly right down the line, uh, start with you, Mr. Dodds. Why do you sure. think that uh, there haven't been more? Is it lack of money? What's the problem? Uh, Chairman Towns, as, as we all collectively mentioned, uh, we've put an enormous amount of resources to make sure that we opened this up to as many trial modifications as possible based on 
uh, stated income as opposed to verified income. So we really opened the door to as many people as we could. Um, we, so how uh, long should it take for the trial modification? I'm sorry? How long should that take if you put well, a uh, trial uh, modification? How long should it take? It takes city about four months, which happens to be amongst the, the, the fastest in the industry. But um, uh, I don't believe uh, we have three trial payments, and then that converts to a modification, a permanent modification after that. But to answer your question, uh, Chairman, I believe that the reason the permanent mods are, are not as high as we would expect them to be is because in many cases uh, the um, documents that actually come in don't match with um, what was stated at the time of uh, the trial modification. And many borrowers were not able to make the trial payments. Uh, those have been, I would say, the two principal reasons for the fallout. Mr. Sewer. Uh, under the HAMP program, the primary reason are 40 percent of the uh, borrowers who have been in a trial modification have failed to make a payment. And I think that's reflective of the ongoing stress of uh, the economy on those borrowers. And uh, I think it is important to look at the number of permanent modifications holistically. Uh, and when you look at our number, HAMP is a small number of a much larger larger total of the 630,000 modifications to understand that it's one of many tools that we use for borrowers. Yeah. Mr. Freeman, same question to you. Um, in our particular situation, uh, we service a lot of loans that just don't qualify under the HAMP guidelines, um, such as uh, a conforming loan or non-conforming loans. We may have certain restrictions under uh, service or guidelines, but the vast majority of the real issue is really that we are so limited under this 31 percent debt to income test and the fact that in our particular book of business, the borrower must occupy the property as their principal place of residence. So, um, and then also the, the documentation issue. You know, we initially up front had done always verification and requested documents up front. So once we've got a borrower into a plan, we have a very high conversion rate. But again, it's a lot of this is on the borrower side as well or the, the complexities of the uh, uh, program itself. What I'd like to add is I think context is important here. Um, when you think about the half a million mods Wells Fargo has done, about 80 percent of those are outside of the HAMP program, and the vast majority of those are permanent mods already or are on their way to becoming permanent mods. Inside the HAMP program, inside the 20 percent, the primary factors in terms of converting from uh, to trial to permanent are the same Treasury quoted in their report. Lack of documentation because of the stated income programs of last summer, that has since changed. Um, once documents are received, customers are not eligible for the program and therefore go through a cancellation phase and get, you typically get a modification outside of the HAMP program. And then finally, customers that just don't make the three trial payments within the HAMP program itself are the three primary HAMP factors. But I, I would encourage you to continue to keep focus on the fact that the vast majority of mods getting done are happening uh, outside the HAMP program itself. Mr. Loman, real quick. Uh, just echoing the same thing that the, my uh, compatriots here have, have spoken about. Uh, missed payments and uh, no documents returned from borrowers are the major reasons why uh, modifications don't get completed. Uh, about a third of those that, um, that do, do give us documents uh, and, and do in fact uh, um, make the payments, uh, a third of the total population ultimately end up in a mod. When you say no, you don't get the documents, I mean, uh, is it a lack of communication, you know, because a person? Well, we, we've made extensive uh, refinements in our process, uh, including uh, communicating with borrowers and, you know, writing them letters and knocking on doors and what have you. That, that process obviously has evolved over time. Um, I would say at the beginning of the program that may have been the case, but I would say now we're equipped to adequately, you know, communicate with borrowers. Is communication a problem I mean, for just very quickly? Yay, nay. Uh, could you sort of tell me? Mr. Chairman, I believe that the issue is <clears throat> actually um, as you sort of analyze the, uh, the contact rates, 
uh, it seems to us that at late at a late stage of delinquency, a lot of customers have a very low contact rate, primarily because they may have checked out from the process. Uh, so uh, this needs early intervention is really critical. Yeah. No, is anything we, we is there anything that we need to do because you know people are losing their homes, and I just can't see if a person is losing his or her house that they're not going to cooperate in terms of documentation. Yeah, you know, because I mean they're asking for help. And that's the part I don't quite understand. Maybe a couple of examples might help. I think there's a lot going on when a customer's in fear of losing their home. And we're doing everything we possibly can to make sure that doesn't happen. A couple of the documents that are troublesome is the, the HAMP program does require a tax return. I think you know, that conjures up fears that will let trigger an IRS audit. Those kinds of things are very real in people's minds. The HAMP a, a modification agreement itself is a very intimidating looking piece of paper. It's a five pages single spaced, uh, very intimidating, very scary kind of process that I think people are reluctant or fearful uh, to carry, you know, what else might happen here. So I don't think it's the communication between servicer and homeowner that's at issue here. I don't think there's additional things that you should do, you should and can do. I think this is really now a matter of working very dil diligently and very hard with every single customer to make sure that foreclosure does not happen. And now you have uh, five minutes, and gentlemen, from uh, Ohio. Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, HAMP, I think, has not only failed to help people, it's, it's, it's actually harmed families, uh, I think, in two ways. One is the, the comments uh, that the, the Wall Street Journal had, and I, I related to my opening statement, the false hope it gave people who were in the temporary or trial modification program who never qualified in the financial implications of going through that process or part of that part of that process. I also think, secondly, the point Mr. Pinto raised. I think his, his quote was, it derailed private sector efforts to help. Uh, so I think in two ways it's been not just a failure to help, but also potentially caused harm to the very families we're, who, were, who were trying to get the help and who were trying to, to uh, provide help, uh, help to. Um, the numbers you all gave, I have 900,000 for Citi, 600,000 for, for Bank of America, 135,000 for home mortgage servicing. 500,000 for Wells Fargo and 846,000 for JP Morgan. Of, of those numbers, I'm going to go down the list, 900,000 uh, modifications you've made, what, what number uh, of those are HAMP modifications? I, I took that as being the, all the, the big yes. number. Okay. Uh, since 2007, we've helped 900,000 homeowners. Right. Uh, what, what, uh, what percentage have been HAMP or what's the number for HAMP? Well, recently we offered uh, HAMP trials to 150,000 uh, customers and out of that about 30 odd thousand have taken HAMP. 38? So, 30,000, 30, 35,000. Small percentage. Yes. Uh, 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 go to Bank of America. 630,000 permanent modifications since 2008. 70,000 of them are HAMP. Uh, we have reported out about 8,800, and we have about 16,000 um, yeah, 16, currently in trial periods. But And, and permanent? For permanent. Uh, the, the 88 Eight. is reported okay. out as permanent. 8,000 8, out of 135,000 mods, only 8,000 in HAMP. Wells Fargo? We've got 500,000 mods, uh, trials, and permanents. 20% of them are inside of HAMP. And uh, inside of HAMP, there's probably 45,000 in trial yet, probably 40, 45,000 or so in permanent. So total. So less than 10%. 10% has kind of been the no. Go ahead. 257,000 in HAMP of our 846,000. How many are how many are permanent? Uh, permanent, 47,000. So again, very small number. We're talking uh, less than less than 10 percent. Here's the question. I think we just cut to the chase. The people who qualified for HAMP went through this cumbersome process, 800 different rules, 15 sets of guidelines, all the stuff they had to go through. Mr. Uh, Hyde just described what the intimidating process they had to go through. Of the folks in the HAMP, the 47,000 and the small number that you, how many of those are, let's ask it this way. The people who qualified for HAMP, would any of those not qualified for your own modification program? Uh, let's put it this way. For the people that fell out of HAMP, we were able to save about 15 percent more. So the ones who wouldn't qualify for HAMP, you were able to help? Yes. And it's working? And it's working. All right. I uh, can't tell an exact number, but the potential does exist because of the Treasury incentives that it enabled it to make more sense for the investor to be a HAMP modification. But I think m many the of them would those have qualified. Many? Many, but I, I don't know the exact number. Mr. Friedman. Uh, about two-thirds would qualify for a proprietary mod. Two-thirds of the permanent two-thirds, two, I mean, what, what's the number? 
Well, the question I believe was of the HAMP participants, how many would have qualified under a proprietary modification program and about two thirds of those would have. Let me ask it more specifically, of those in HAMP who, who got into permanent status in HAMP, uh, would any of those not got into permanent status with, with one of your programs? Yeah, only only those will be limited by certain investor concerns that under our pooling and servicing agreements. So it'll be a small amount. Uh, I think a timestamp on this is important. If the issue is right now, mm -hmm. I think right now with all the programs available, the majority of customers that get a HAMP would probably get a non-HAMP. I don't have an exact number. To the other point about customers that are canceling out of HAMP, uh, Treasury provided some statistics on that earlier in the week. In Wells Fargo's case, somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of the HAMP cancellations are resulting in some other form of saving the home or avoiding foreclosure. Mr. Lawman. Most would qualify for the proprietary program. So, so I mean, here we are. We got a program where it was promised 75 billion, three to four million uh, folks it was going to help. It's helped 346,000 to date to get into permanent, and yet the vast majority of those who made it into the permanent qualification would have made it in one of your own modification programs without putting taxpayer money, without this, this big government hassle and mess. And then those who got kicked out were also finding out the majority of them you could have helped. Mr. Pinto, I know you went away in on this. We got I, 30 seconds. I just seconds add one ahead. fact. Uh, about 60 percent of all HAMP mods are Fannie Freddie. So this issue, uh, you know, yes, there are some investors outside of that, but Fannie Freddie is, is, is the majority of it. <clears throat> so that's, uh, and, and of course, uh, they don't need to be paid an incentive to, to do uh, what they need to do. Great point. Mr. Chairman, I think this points out. Well, I think, it's, Simon, I think it's obvious what it points out. I gentleman's time has expired. The, um, let me just go to uh, Ms. Spear when she was here. She said something that I agree with. Um, you know, I, I, HAMP is fine, but my, my uh, constituents uh, want to have some kind of relief. And so whatever it takes to accomplish that, that's what we're trying to do. In my district, we, um, we hold what we call foreclosure prevention conferences. We've done 15 of them, so five of them, four of them so far. We just did one uh, about a week ago. And as I listen to your testimony, I understand better now uh, why we're able to save at least two thirds of people's houses. And a lot of it goes to, when you talk about documents, um, what I find, what we found in our office is that a lot of times it is an intimidating process uh, with regard to these applications. And we have two people on our staff and basically what they do almost full time uh, is help people with foreclosure because it is a difficult, it is not the easiest of processes. So I want to go to you all and just ask the question. You, you say that one of the reasons why you can't, it's so difficult that people stay in, in the temporary phase is because um, they're not getting the proper documents in and they're not turning in uh, the way they're supposed to. Well, what we have found is that, be it HAMP or anything else, that a lot of times the mortgage companies are understaffed. I mean, I, and I, I can tell you that for a fact. Now, it's gotten better. And so when people would call in, they couldn't, first of all, they couldn't get anybody on the phone. Then if they got somebody on the phone, they uh, got the runaround. And then if they got somebody and was able to avoid the runaround, then the paperwork got all m mixed up. And I've seen instances where uh, paperwork has been sent to folks, uh, to, went to the mortgage company for or five times, and then the mortgage companies and some of the same companies that are sitting here now have said to my people, and I know this for a fact, that they never got it. And we've actually sent paperwork from our office. So um, I want to know what you all have done with regard to staffing. That is, putting in training staff is one thing to have staff, it's another thing to have a staff that is properly trained. And, um, and what have you done? With regard, we see it seems like you're saying that in order for people to move from a temporary to a permanent, it seems like paperwork is one of the main things that's holding them up. And I heard, I think it, you, Miss Dutcher, say that you know some of these people are not making payments. 
during the temporary stage, I think, was it you that said 40 percent? See, we don't find that to be the case. We find people that want to make the payments. And we've, we've actually found people, a lot of people who have made payments, and then the mortgage company told them they didn't make payments. And we've got, we literally, my staff would have the copy of the check or the money, the money order in their hand. So, you know, there's a disconnect here. So the question is, I'll start with you, Mr. Hyde, since I'm kind of familiar with Wells Fargo. Why don't you tell us what you all are doing with regard to that staffing? And have you found that to be something of significance when you, and if you did staff up, how did it affect the operation and your results? Sure. I, I think your criticism is very fair a year ago. We were not where we should have been a year ago. We've made a lot of progress in the course of the last year. We've attended your events. We've created our own events as ways to gather the documents. And I think most importantly, what we have implemented and by the end of the month will be done is our one-to-one -one approach where every single customer will know exactly who they're working with and everybody on our side knows exactly which customers they're accountable for in a one-to-one -one way. In order to get there, we've added more than 10,000 people over the course of the last year. It's kind of expensive, huh? I'm sorry? Kind of expensive. Absolutely. Would you all rather see somebody stay in a house than, than be foreclosed upon? Absolutely. And, and why is that? I mean, foreclosure is the absolute last resort. And I mean, a lot of reasons. I mean, one, it's the right thing to do. Uh, beyond the right thing to do, economically, it's always in the investor's interest, our shareholder's interest, the community interest, customer interest, to do everything you possibly can to keep the customer in the home or find an alternative to foreclosure. Uh, I think every one of us sitting at the table would completely say to you, foreclosure is absolutely the last resort. Mr. Towns and I, Chairman Towns and I, sit on the conference committee for Wall Street reform, and we had an amend. There was a, 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 a an amendment yesterday to make sure that there was a, a temporary a fund, a resolving loan fund for $3 billion to help people who may have lost their jobs. Every single Republican voted against it, every single one of them. And I heard some of them say a little bit earlier that they were concerned that not enough wasn't done, being done by Congress. Fortunately, it passed on the House side in the conference. But, uh, but I see my time is up, and perhaps uh, I can get some answers to whether you all believe such a thing is very important later. Uh, Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I, I thank you for all being here, and thank you for being um, so helpful in, in, uh, in your answers, because as you know, we're, we're all struggling and trying to figure this out. And as we're trying to figure it out, uh, you have specific expertise, not just in your view of the government program, but in the issue of you know, what's happening in the market, what's happening with homeowners, and, and what needs to be done. So I appreciate that you've been so forthcoming. Um, as I said in my opening, you know, Treasury Secretary Geithner yesterday, um, w when uh, appearing before the Congressional Oversight Panel, uh, said about HAMP, this program was not designed to prevent foreclosures. It was not designed to sustain homeownership at a level that would be unacceptable, imprudent to try and do. He was then asked about the homeownership rate level. What, what would it be, what would be a um, a markedly uh, market efficient number. Um, someone offered 65 percent, and he tended to agree that that was an objective. Reuters responds. Um, <coughs> Reuters relates his statement as Geithner said he agreed with the assessment that housing will only stabilize as more homeowners become renters again. Do you guys agree with that? Do you agree with our Treasury Secretary that the market will only stabilize as more homeowners become renters? Because that seems contrary to what our whole whole goal was here in trying to stabilize homeowners in their home. Mr. Stoss, we'll start with you. Congressman, uh, I'm not qualified to answer the Treasury Secretary's response, but I will say that um, um, when, we f when we focused on hemp as an industry, we wanted to create a great uniform baseline across the country. There was no baseline modification. There were all kinds of proprietary programs. So in the last year, hemp has done We've done a great deal with respect to HAMP to get to a uniform baseline. However, there will be fallouts and there will be redefaults. And I believe that the issue needs to move, the focus needs to move beyond modifications to foreclosure prevention. Um, and I believe that short sales and deed in lieu is, are the programs that we, sh we should really focus on. And I believe that that's where the right. discussion Ms. should Ms. Doster, be. Ms. Doster, do you believe more people need to be renters? 
The HAMP program and other modification programs are primarily built to ensure that the payment is affordable and what HAMP has done is set a new standard for the industry at that 31 percent debt to income ratio of the Mortgage Taxes Insurance Homeowners Association to income. And in that spirit, there are a large number of, of, of people who would not qualify and I agree that at some point if they can't afford to sustain uh, a, a mortgage payment at a level commensurate with their income, then they do need to move on to alternative kinds of housing. And that's what short sales and deed in lieu and other programs uh, are, are attempting. Uh, and we're working hard to ensure that there's a dignified transition as an alternative the, the, to foreclosure. The point that the Treasury Secretary made, which is why I'm asking the question, and, and I disagree with the Treasury Secretary, is it, it's not that he's talking about the individual decision of a homeowner as a borrower who finds themselves in an untenable debt position and then must make the choice of, of leaving the home, surrendering it, going through then the process of becoming a renter. He's actually saying that for housing prices to stabilize, that he personally believes that more homeowners should become renters, according to Reuters. And that seems contrary to this program. And, and of course, he characterizes it here as this program was not designed to prevent foreclosures, which I, I could have sworn that that's what President Obama said it was supposed to do. Um, Mr. Friedman, what do you think about more people becoming renters? Well, <clears throat> again, you know, I wasn't uh, around the secretary when he made the comment, but I mean, I do believe it is a fact that, you know, not all homeowners can afford their mortgage payment. And as a result, you know, like many of us, if you, you know, spend too much money on something, you have to uh, cut something else out. And I think, you know, um, that could very well be what he meant. I think as a general policy, you know, I think home ownership is a great thing if people don't get greedy and they can then, you know, can pay their mortgage and, and can afford all those things that go along with home ownership. Well, one other thing I want to add, because my time is expiring, is that in listening to all of your testimonies about how you have been approaching homeowners, I can tell you that the anecdotal stories that we hear from uh, realtors, from nonprofits that are trying to assist homeowners is that the loan servicers are not responsive that in fact it is an incredibly difficult process even when you have a, um, a social worker that is sitting guiding someone through the process that in, in fact you are making decisions that don't follow the market that when there's short sales that are offered that in fact you allow the loans to go to foreclosure and I want to say mr. chairman I think one thing that would be really helpful is to have not a panel uh, of loan servicers but have loan servicers on one side of the room and have realtors and nonprofits that are helping people on one side of the room and let these two people go at it because we're hearing a different story than you're telling us today. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to the gentleman at the, uh, and the uh, gentlelady at the table, uh, each of you represents lenders or agents of lenders who would not exist in their current form but for the beneficence of the United States taxpayer. And I remind each of you that out, without the continued support of the American taxpayer, there would be virtually zero residential housing market activity. The issue before us today is why in the world aren't you giving loan modifications to more eligible borrowers? Why are you denying loan modifications to my constituents in spite of the fact that we have a federal program which pays you, the mortgage holders, an incentive to modify the terms of the mortgages? and compensate you for many of your costs. I'd, I'd like to uh, hear some justification. Mr. Lohman, you want to respond? Yeah, um, we're helping all the people that, um, that come to us and that we contact. Um, we have made extensive investments in people, uh, systems, um, you know, infrastructure. Um, the folks uh, that don't get a modification, uh, it's generally for two reasons. Either um, they failed to pay us during the trial period uh, or they don't qualify for, the, for their programs. Um, maybe their income isn't, isn't enough to afford a home. Um, or they don't provide the required documents. Okay, well, let me, let me just share this with you. At the end of May, my state of Ohio had 136,910 seriously delinquent loans, and only 12.95% of those loans have been modified. 
So here's Ohio, it's 42nd out of 51, including the District of Columbia, in the ratio of HAMP modifications to seriously delinquent loans. Now, in early May, I held an open meeting in my district with uh, Treasury Assistant Secretary Allison. And in that meeting, I want you to know, Mr. Lohman, that in Cleveland, Ohio, I heard from numerous advocates and homeowners that your bank is the most difficult one to deal with when it comes to loan modifications. Over and over, I've heard the Chase has been especially slow to process paperwork. I've heard that Chase denies borrowers modifications without supplying a reason. I've heard that Chase leaves borrowers facing foreclosure in limbo. Now, of the four largest mortgage servicers, all of which are represented here today, why is the average length of trial modification for Chase mortgagers nearly seven and a half months, Mr. Lohman? As, as we've mentioned, all of us have mentioned, uh, the resource uh, needs for this program uh, have, you know, outstripped uh, our ability to have the right number of people in seats uh, performing the functions. We have... Um, so you're under, we, you, you're we, saying you don't have enough people to handle the we program? We have historically not had enough people to handle the demand for the program. Uh, we were the, one of the first out of the box when the HAMP program uh, was announced and you know we, we started um, accepting you know, here's an, here's an, applications. I'm, excuse me because I, I have limited time here. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, the program's been going on for 19 months. That's correct. And we've Now it, it seems to me you could. We've hired you know, thousands you, you of people in those periods. I understand. It seems to me you know the demand. Your performance is, uh, is, is very weak. If you know there's a demand and you're getting incentivized anyhow from the taxpayers See, I just wonder how hard you're really trying. That, that's the concern that I have. And when right. I get reports from my own constituents that you're uh, denying modifications without supplying a reason and you're leaving borrowers facing foreclosure in limbo, uh, your explanation doesn't cut it. We, we have increased our staff. We've invested in our systems. Um, we do have, have historically had a backlog of loans that are in trial, and now we are literally looking at every loan that's in a trial beyond its original trial period, looking at it loan by loan, making sure that we don't leave any stones unturned to give folks a modification. What do I tell and, my constituents? And, what do and, I tell my constituents when they tell me Chase won't work with them? They should um, they should call the one eight hundred number. One eight hundred number that what, what number should I call the one eight number? You should call the one eight hundred number, number I, that we number that, I can call you Absolutely. Mr. Lohman? There is. On behalf of my constituents? Yes. Okay, I'll, we'll, we'll chat afterwards. Yeah, then. absolutely. Be happy to do it. I, I want to help you do more we, and do better. We, we have a number that, that I can, can put on the record. 1-800-335-0123 for anybody uh, who has constituent complaints. Be happy to personally deal with them. I just, I just want to make sure, Mr. Chairman, it's not like those bumper stickers that say you like my driving, call one 800 Gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Duncan. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, we have a uh, memo that says more borrowers have been kicked out of HAMP than have received permanent modifications. Cumulatively, HAMP has now placed 346,000 borrowers in permanent mortgage modifications, but this is overshadowed by the fact that 429,000 temporary modifications and 6,300 permanent modifications have been canceled. But I'm now told also that the Fitch Rating Service recently came out and, and said that uh, they estimated that 75 percent of those permanent modifications will ultimately default. And, I, and then I'm also told that TARP set aside $75 billion for this program, but only 30 to $40 million has been paid out in the first uh, year and a half. At that rate, it would take 200 years, roughly, I guess, to get all this money out, which it seems to me uh, ridiculous that they've set aside that much money for what it now appears to be a, f a failed or failing uh, program. Because I just heard in response to questions from uh, uh, Chairman Jordan that, uh, uh, that only about 10 to 20 percent of your loan modifications are under HAMP in the first place, and that uh, and we were told before the hearing, and I, my understanding is now that's been confirmed here uh, by most of you that uh, 
almost all of these uh, uh, modifications under HAMP, you would have tried to work that work out uh, through your own private uh, uh, modification program. So uh, I, I don't believe I've ever heard of a, a program that is uh, uh, doing less uh, or working uh, in a worse way just about. And that's a, I, I, I'm wondering, um, um, I'm wondering if any of you would uh, dispute what Mr. Pinto said when he, he estimated that uh, HAMP will ultimately meet only 6 to 8 percent of its original goal and, uh, and he used the words numbing com complexity. Do any, do any of you dispute those, that estimate, that uh, a very pessimistic estimate that he has presented here today or uh, would any of you dispute his description of the uh, requirements uh, as, as being numbing complexity? Congressman, uh, I'm not sure that I would use um, that phrase to describe HAMP. I believe that um, <clears throat> we all stood behind HAMP and created it together along with, you, with, with the Treasury Department. We wanted to make sure that we had one uniform program and we really focused on scale on that program. And I think it's important for us to understand that we all collectively got behind this problem and, and focused on scale. Uh, last year, it wasn't the case. Um, more importantly, we got um, the GSEs uh, to c come behind the program, and all our loss mitigators now had one program that they had to deal with as opposed to nuanced proprietary programs. So I believe that HAMP worked and worked in scale when it needed to. However, I believe there's a part B to that, which is that this problem is moving. It's moving forward. Uh, and I believe that we now need to focus on fallouts from HAMP, we need to focus on redefaults, and we really need to focus on a targeted foreclosure prevention program. So HAMP needs to evolve, no question. But I think that it served its purpose when it did. And um, uh, I want to applaud uh, my colleagues for having tried as hard as they did, uh, along with ourselves, in uh, scaling uh, what, what, what was an important response to, the, to homeowners at the time. Uh, comments? If I may, I just add one other thing. Is is before HAMP, there was uh, I, I think one of the the significant advantages of HAMP has been the establishment of sta standards, and in particular the debt to income ratio that was used even on our proprietary programs prior to HAMP was higher than the 31 percent. And to establish that as a standard, that's usual and customary, so that where we have uh, the ability to work on behalf of investors, we can do so, has enabled the results we do have with HAMP, but equally importantly, the results that we do have in our proprietary programs as well. So that is a significant advantage. Of course, if it, if it was working the way it should, uh, uh, your companies uh, would stand to make a lot of money out of it and become government uh, contractors, at least to the extent in this uh, for this program. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, yes, I'll yield. Following up on that, ma'am, uh, if, uh, if, if you, in fact, had the higher debt to ratio, in other words, if Treasury had effectively sent, set it at 45, 55, wouldn't you have more loans going out today? I'll ask on my own time. I'm sorry. Go ahead. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is for their willingness to come and help us. In my state, we've seen uh, the number of foreclosures uh, double uh, this past month, uh, month of May 2010 compared to month of May 2009. It's actually gone up 120 percent. And uh, unlike when this uh, housing crisis first struck, when we saw a lot of subprime mortgages out there and, and uh, poor product and maybe people who were in homes that they couldn't afford, now we see the greatest correlation is uh, unemployment with uh, people not being able to stay in their homes. And I'm wondering if uh, this tool that we initially uh, came up with, the HAMP program, is the right tool to deal with that type of problem. Uh, because if someone's out of work and there's not the uh, stream of income to support a mortgage, it doesn't matter how you design it or how you 
you modify it, if there is no income to support that mortgage, it's going to end up in, in foreclosure. Uh, and, and so I'm fearful. I, I see how this is all working out. I see all the attempts you're making. I also see that uh, about 434,000 people who were, were kicked out of the HAMP program, the trial program, because you could not verify uh, income. And uh, so, so what I'm afraid of what's happening is here, uh, under TARP, which, which, which created the HAMP program, uh, which I voted against uh, because I did not approve of the bailout for the, for the Wall Street banks. Uh, under this program, you're being paid an awful lot of money to process these uh, attempted modifications, these trials. But after you do all this work, which you're being paid for by taxpayer money, I see 434,000 people kicked out of the program, so, so their foreclosures were delayed for a little bit. And it, uh, it allowed you to be paid for that attempt, but at the end of the day, the taxpayer money is spent by your firms because 50% of the second mortgage market is sitting at that table right there. 50% uh, of the national second second liens. Uh, so I just think this is uh, sort of insult to injury. We're spending all this money on the program. It is, it is accruing to your benefit in a significant way. The taxpayer is being hurt and the homeowners are not being helped in a significant way. That's, you know, and, and I understand. I understand the dynamic that's out there now. It's just different because we've got all these people who are unemployed and and uh, in some cases, you can't modify that because there's nothing to support it, no, no income stream. But uh, let me ask you straight up, do you think this program should be uh, continued beyond October? We only have a few months left here. There have been, there's been very few people helped by this program. Uh, but as the folks that are administering this and seeing how many people are being helped and how much money is being spent here, uh, do, you, do you think this program should be extended uh, come October, given the fact that we still have streams and streams of, uh, of foreclosures uh, coming down the pike. Mr. Das? Um, yes, sir. I believe that the short answer is that I believe that this program should be continued. As I have said before, this program provided a great, a great baseline and, and a uniform baseline. If we didn't have all of the GSEs and all of the banks participating in this program in a uniform way, there could be a lot of consumer confusion, as we saw in the beginning of last year. I would, however, submit that this program needs to be enhanced. As you rightly pointed out, Congressman, uh, unemployment is a big issue. And um, not being able to sustain, have a sustainable income stream uh, to make the payment Mr. will Mr. Doss, I only have a little bit of time, and I just want to find out if you wanted the program to be continued. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Sir? Uh, if I could, just one clarification. We are only paid as a servicer at the time of the permanent modification, not during the trial uh, period. And I do believe the program should be extended to allow the new components of the program, the second lien program, the home affordable foreclosure alternative short sale program, as well as the unemployment and principal forgiveness components of it should be allowed to play out to determine if that can help more borrowers stay in their homes. Thank you. Mr. Friedman? Um, yeah, I think it would be, it should be continued now, especially in light that the program now you're verifying items up front. So I think that will actually help um, see much more positive results out of the program. Mr. Hyde? And I would add for the 80% uh, of the mods that are happening outside the program, there is no government payment of any kind. As far as your question on the program itself, I would continue it. I would finish the enhancements already made. I would not expand it. Okay. Mr. Lawman? Yes, it should continue. And Mr. Pinto? would ask uh, Treasury to provide very clear information, which they promised many, many months ago, about redefault rates. They have published virtually no information about redefaults. Uh, there is a benchmark for that, and I mentioned it in my testimony, the Mortgage Metrics Report. You need to know how this program is doing compared to the way OCC has been tracking for 18 months modifications. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. 
Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from California, the ranking member, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And before I begin, I think I've, we've both heard enough to know that we need to have Treasury back here well before the October uh, end to talk about lessons learned and if there is to be any modification extension be, to get to a sooner rather than later, wouldn't you agree? Well, you know, we've had Treasury in here, and uh, I mean, so it's not something that we have not done. You know, I think there's a lot of questions that should be raised, even you know, with the people that are involved in terms of uh, with the services, because you know, let's give you a classic example, and then I'm going to let you uh, gain your time. I'll take this off of my time some kind of way. Uh, that you have people that were put into mortgages. Uh, I mean, by folks that are no longer probably working for the bank now. They're gone. In, in somewhere and then now they're coming in you know what happens to them there's a lot of things that you know I think we need to spend time now talking with uh, the services and people who uh, have experienced these things people probably got fired because they put people into mortgages that they knew uh, that they shouldn't have gone into I think these are some questions that we need to get answered before we even deal with anybody else on that note I want you to know I did not take it off of your time I, I thank the gentleman uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for giving us this opportunity today. Uh, before I come to Miss, and give me your correct pronunciation. I didn't hear it ever. Desor. Desor. Uh, I, I had uh, I previously asked you about the fact that a new level of income to debt had been established. Uh, prior to that time, well, certainly with stated income, it's often called liar loans and so on. Uh, somebody could have. 100% uh, income to uh, actual income to uh, uh, to debt, but certainly many people in your experience had much higher ratios, 45, 50% relying on two incomes at their highest level. Isn't that true? Uh, that's correct. There were higher incomes in the origination side of right. the, the So business. when we look at failures in backward looking, an artificially high ability to make a loan, often to flip it to government programs, Freddie and Fannie and so on, uh, but allow, allowing a much higher ratio was part of the situation because if there was any hiccup in the income or if they didn't appreciate and they weren't able to pull money out, ultimately there was a problem we were, wait, we were heading toward now that you have the opportunity to look back at, at what happened starting in, in the case of Mr. Kucinich's district in 2006, but in the case of other districts a little later. Isn't that right? Uh, yes, the programs are intended when there is a hardship, which means that income has been right. disrupted, to then revamp right. the mortgage payment to so be more affordable tied to that income. Right. So at 31 percent, is this the right number going forward? When I was a kid, it was lower. Uh, 25 percent would have been a stretch in many cases. Uh, what would you say the right number is in order to not ha to have enough cushion for normal ups and downs of income and so on, and still be able to stay in your home and meet your mortgage? I believe a 31 percent ratio is appropriate, but not for everyone. And in particular, when you look at a low-income household, 31 percent is probably still high. So we have been recommending to Treasury that they consider lowering that for certain categories of borrowers. And on a proprietary basis, we're looking at the same thing. Okay. Well, I think that's uh, certainly good judgment. It's something that I don't think is partisan here. Uh, let me uh, let me ask one question to all of you. If if we had known. 10 years ago what we know now, and if the borrowers had known 10 years ago what they know now, wouldn't you assume that many of them would have bought less house than they're currently in that you're trying to keep them in? Okay. What I'm really saying is you're trying to keep people in homes that are right on the edge of their affording even after you do modifications. Wouldn't it be true that if they had chosen or were able to think again 10 years back and buy a, a home in a different price range that they might be very good homeowners. Well, in many cases, you have a hard time keeping them in the home they have. I'll just go down the thing and it's close to a yes or no as you can, Mr. Doss. Uh, based on what we know now, absolutely, Congressman. And um, it's one of the reasons why we stayed away from option arms to start with. Yes, ma'am. Yes, it's the reason Bank of America exited the subprime business in the year 2000. Um, I would like to comment one other thing is I think back to the debt to income ratio um, it's our strong opinion that you really need to look at the whole totality of the borrower situation the debt to income ratio 
under HAMP only deals with the housing piece and doesn't deal with the debtor's overall uh, situation. Sure. Uh, other than that, I would say also yes. Mr. Hyde. You know, I think hindsight's a wonderful thing. I think the key is we're here now, and the key right now is achieving affordability for homeowners that want to and have the willingness to stay in their home. Yes. Mr. Pinto, I, I know you'd say that we suckered people into too expensive a home. Yes. Yes. And I would also add that uh, the back ratio that was just referred to, the total debt ratio, is running 64 percent, and it's actually been going up. And that means that's before food, clothing, right. anything. So my follow-up on this is, Knowing what we know now from 10 years ago, whether it's HAMP or some of the load modifications, in many, many, many cases, isn't our real goal to keep people in a house often keeping them in a house that's bigger and more expensive, even after reductions, than it would have been right sized for them to begin with? And as such, if the federal government's going to be trying to find affordable housing for people on the edge income wise, and, and we're, if we're lucky enough to have the Treasury back up here, and if they're looking at extending this program, isn't there a component missing from HAMP? And that is that it, it keeps people in the house they're in, rather than evaluating whether, in fact, there's a completely affordable non-renter situation that is eclipsed by the fact that they're in this house right now. And, you know, I know that's beyond your purview. You're not realtors, and you're not able to say, look, get out of this house and get in this house in most cases. but isn't that something that as we're bringing Treasury up, if there's going to be an extension, and some of you did look at some continuation of this program between October, isn't that a component that is fundamentally missing, which is affordable housing starts not with the house you picked, but with the house that was affordable? Mr. Doss. Congressman, I, I believe that you raise a very, uh, very important and a very interesting point, and I would concur with you. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. You know, I think the key to HAMP and the key to any mod program is to make sure it's affordable now, that the consumer can afford the home they're in with the payment they have right now. So, moment. Yes. Okay, I'll settle for a yes. I can take it for an answer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Thank you very much. I now yield to Mr. Connolly of Virginia, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Lullerman, you said that despite some reports to the contrary, HAMP modification performance has been strong, helping hundreds of thousands of homeowners. Could you explain how HAMP augments your other mortgage modification programs? Yeah, well, um, we offer uh, HAMP in the, is top of the waterfall. Um, so th that, that is the first program that we offer. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it is the primary, uh, you know, first point of uh, defense in, in providing a modification. If a person, for whatever reason, doesn't qualify for HAMP, uh, either it's a jumbo loan or it's uh, a loan that was done uh, past the date of the effective date of HAMP, or for some reason it's fallen out of HAMP, uh, then we use our proprietary program. So it one augments the other, or yes. complements the other. Yes. Mr. Hyde, you stated that HAMP has facilitated the industry's ability to deliver more streamlined solutions than ever before. Could you elaborate on how HAMP has strengthened mortgage assistance beyond the programs offered by the private sector? Yeah, I think what I meant by that and what I think is important is a timestamp. When you think about how and when HAMP was first created, it was the beginning of 2009. At that time, most of the loan modification programs that existed required an individual handling and individual approval from an investor. With the uh, creation of HAMP, a more systematic program was created. I think HAMP did serve as a catalyst to get other programs going. I think it did serve as a bit of a mobilizing event to push um, servicers to take broader actions at a more rapid pace. I think it pushed other investors, including Fannie and Freddie, to move in a direction of programmatic home and loan modifications. That's what I meant by the fact that there was a broader effect from it. So it's a it actually leveraged other programs, private sector programs, but for HAMP, maybe they wouldn't have, they would have been slower, smaller, or maybe non-existent. Yeah, at the time. I mean, again, this was 2009. I think it certainly sped things along. We're at a different point in time right now. Uh, any estimate of what the number might be in terms of what falls into the category of additional refinances uh, or modifications that were leveraged because of HAMP? 
you know, I don't have a number for you. I think what I would say is that we're, there were definitely loan modification attempts being made throughout. It's not as though customers weren't getting assistance. Right. I think what happened is the, uh, the uh, idea of HAMP was a national systematic program, and I think national standards, national programs are always useful. Thank you. Mr. Sir, Mr. Pinto seemed to imply that HAMP is just displacing private sector mortgages, uh, modification programs, which seems to contradict your testimony and that of others in the panel that said HAMP complements the proprietary loan modification programs Bank of America uh, and others have developed. Could you elaborate? Uh, yes, and it gets back to the point of, of which loans and which customers are eligible for HAMP. And again, as I said, out of our 1.4 million customers who are delinquent 60 days or more, there are about 478,000 that are eligible for HAMP. We lead with HAMP in the waterfall for those of options. And if they fail to meet the HAMP requirements, then we can offer other alternatives. For the rest of the customers in the portfolio, we are doing modifications. But again, the advantage is that HAMP provided that floor or that standard in terms of a debt to income ratio and capability that we can leverage in those programs for, for, for customers who are not explicitly eligible uh, for HAMP by its definition. If I understand your testimony and that of Mr. Hyde, Mr. Lullerman, far from displacing the private sector, it actually provides a certain framework for you to build upon and expand. That's correct. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. I now yield five minutes to the Congresswoman from California, Ms. Spear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, while I was not in the room, I was listening to the um, testimony. And I, I'm somewhat struck by the questioning that was offered by Mr. Lynch when he asked if you wanted to see the program continue. And virtually every one of you said yes although my colleagues um, on the other side of the aisle very much want to see the program um, disappear. So uh, it would be helpful to us if you can, in a narrative, um, provide to the committee precisely why you think the program should continue. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Lohman, I think um, Congressman Kucinich said that he had great difficulties with um, your particular company. And I would like to just echo those. I have a number of cases here that are truly disturbing that are um, loans by Chase. Um, this couple, retired school teacher, retired husband, um, Chase has lost four sets of applications. And this is a, a story we hear over and over again where documentation is sent, documentation is lost. When a, a consumer sends it in four times, has documentation they send in four times, and you can't find it. That's your problem. And it reminds me a little bit of um, the, the issue with the Mineral Mine Service, um, where basically if they didn't permit the Horizon Deepwater rig within 30 days, it was automatically considered approved. Um, now, in that particular situation, clearly that shouldn't have been the case. But we might argue that here, at some point, the lender has to take responsibility for not having the documentation when it's been sent over and over again. Now, I have two people dedicated to doing only foreclosures and modifications in my office. That's a lot of staff, and I would bet that every member on this panel would say the same thing. I would ask you to create a legislative uh, liaison individual within each of your companies that we can call. And I would like for you to contemplate that. If you are going to do it, I would like for you to identify who that is and present it to the committee. If you're not going to do it, I want you to explain to the committee why you won't do it. Um, if we're really going to get to the bottom of this and keep people in their homes, we've got to have more accountability everywhere. Um, and I guess, Mr. Chairman, I really don't have a question. I just had a, a series of statements I wanted to make. Thank you. And they should not have an 800 number, right? It should not be an 800 number. <laughs> thank, thank you. I now yield to the gentleman from um, uh, Ohio. Who, thank you, Mr. Ohio. Chairman. I'm sorry, just a moment. Just a moment. And my staff is saying it's Ms. Norton? Mr. Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank Apologize. you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I'll try to be brief so that my colleague gets a chance to get his question in. 
Studies have demonstrated and, and suggested that minority communities, minority homeowners have been disproportionately affected by the crisis. And I think many people agree with that. Secondly, uh, they suggest that some of the reasons have been targeting of subprime loans in these communities and neighborhoods and, of course, higher rates of employment. Are your companies doing anything as you try and do loan modifications to take those factors into account so that these individuals can experience modifications? Yes, sir. At City, we have uh, <coughs> um, a program where uh, and individuals who are dedicated to working with communities on the ground and we have the Office of Homeowner Protection. We actually are, send people to the sites to work with communities and help people with the documentation process. And as I said uh, in my testimony, we also work very closely with uh, Hope Now uh, to make sure that we are on the ground working with the communities. We're very, very closely uh, aligned with the communities. I personally go down and and and, and interact. Anyone else? Yes, we. Uh, this is Barbara Desar, Bank of America. We take a similar approach where we have dedicated teams. Uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, we did 360 community events. Those events tend to take place in the communities where the need is the greatest, highest uh, disruptions to income uh, and that sort of thing. So we intentionally supplement our outreach via letters, via telephone calls, versus one-on-one -on -one people we send out to homeowners with community events that we participate in and nonprofits that we help fund to, to host those events. Mr. Chairman, could I just ask that each uh, one of the witnesses would respond to that question in writing, and I'll give back my time so that uh, there might be enough time. Yeah. For, for but, all. I thank you, gentlemen. And also, let me just add that um, also I'd like for you to, re to respond to Ms. Spears' question, too, in writing. I'd like for you to respond to both. And we will keep the record open, you know, for additional seven days to be able to ascertain that information. Yeah. Gentleman from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm sorry that my colleagues from the other side have left because I wanted to refresh the memory, uh, especially of Mr. Jordan from Ohio, uh, because we served in the state legislature in Ohio together. And we did know about the problems eight years ago because we did a very extensive study on subprime lending in the state of Ohio. And the Democrats pushed hard uh, for legislation that would have cracked down on subprime lending. Um, it was predatory lending legislation. And it was my Republican colleagues that held that up. And they held it up for years. And the same thing was happening in this very Congress. Stephanie Tubbs Jones, uh, who has since passed away, in 2001 introduced predatory lending legislation. It was done year after year after year after year. And I think the voters have to understand that the reason we're here today talking about loan modifications is because not just of the economy today and the foreclosures, as Mr. Lynch described, due to unemployment, but because of all the poor underwriting and the securitization of the loans in the subprime market that could have been prevented had we addressed predatory lending legislation in this Congress, that could have been prevented had we passed predatory lending legislation in the states. But the Republicans repeatedly stood in the way of that. And now today, as the conference is meeting in financial services that might address the underlying problems of the lack of regulation in mortgage-backed securities and credit default swaps, my Republican colleagues are again standing in the way and trying to prevent any systemic changes to the system that got us here in the first place. So uh, I think it's sad that we're here today talking about all of these loan modifications because I don't think many of these loans should have happened in the first place because so many of them were in the subprime market. And while I appreciate that some of the financial institutions quit writing in the subprime market years ago, uh, Mr. Sir, I will remind you that Countrywide was very, very active in the subprime market and led to thousands of foreclosures in the state of Ohio. Um, my question to you is this. I have gotten a lot of complaints. Uh, back home as we look at people who are trying to seek modifications, that the modifications, uh, although the discussions have started and these haven't been finalized, these modifications, the banks continue to proceed with foreclosure proceedings. This is sending mixed messages. And while I realize Treasury has sent out some directives on this recently, I'm very concerned that we're sending mixed messages to homeowners who are trying to seek modifications but at the same time hearing from the bank that they're 
closing on their property. I'd like to know what each of your financial institutions does in that case and whether or not we should stop the practice of proceeding on foreclosures if we're in negotiations on loan modifications so that it doesn't lead to the homeowners backing out because they fear their house is going into foreclosure anyway. Mr. Doss, we'll start with you. Congressman, uh, <clears throat> let me be very clear that foreclosure is absolutely the last and least preferred alternative for city. When we offer somebody a HAMP modification, if they fall out of HAMP, we immediately offer them a whole range of, of city supplemental modifications. In fact, we are able to double the number of modifications we offer as a result of our proprietary programs. If they fail that, we offer them um, short sales and deed, deed in lieu programs aggressively so that they can if I can interrupt you, Mr. Doss, because we do have to go over for the boats. What I'm trying to find out is when you begin the discussion with a homeowner on a loan modification, do you stop the foreclosure process? Or do you allow it to continue until that modification is finalized? We stop the process. In fact, we, in our trial modification process, we reached out to people who are in foreclosure and offered them trial modification. So as soon as trial modification is offered, you stop the foreclosure process? Yes. All right. Mr. Sir? Uh, we continue the process in parallel, but we are in compliance with the Treasury directives about how that should be handled, and we have significantly enhanced the communication to try to uh, uh, mitigate the concern of the borrower with the promise that we will not take that home to foreclosure sale while they are in the process of uh, being considered for a modification. But, and I've got a concern because it, it sounds as if, you know, you're reaching out to the consumer trying to, you know, work on a modification, but at the same time, that hand that's reaching out, you know, you're about to slap it, you know, with the foreclosure. And so mixed messages are, in fact, being sent. And wouldn't it be better for us to back off on the foreclosure, since we've all said that the foreclosure is the last thing in the world that you want anyway, allow the modification it time to work. If it doesn't work, then go ahead and proceed with the foreclosure process. But the fact that we're on this dual track is very much sending mixed messages. All right. And again, uh, what we're trying to balance is the interest of all the constituents, including that of the investor in the party. And if that does not go through in some places to restart the foreclosure process is a very lengthy period of time. So we're trying to preserve uh, that timeline. But again, we, uh, we have significantly enhanced communication and we are in compliance with the Treasury guidance. Mr. Friedman. Uh, our process is much the same as, as the uh, Bank of America's. I, I believe for, for the customer working with us, I believe we stopped the foreclosure process. The other control we have in place is before a customer's loan goes to completion of foreclosure, we make sure to take a second look to make sure every opportunity has been exhausted. We have uh, a similar process. Uh, we do two quality checks, um, before, one before we commence uh, the foreclosure and then one right before sale to make sure that we don't foreclose on someone that, that's in the process. Again, Madam Chair, I would you know, remind the committee that there seems to be a broad differentiation amongst uh, the financial institutions and the servicers in this case, and it really is a problem for borrowers who are getting mixed messages from the servicers who are genuinely working and, and trying to save their homes, but fear that the bank is going to move forward anyway and because they're hell-bent on having a foreclosure. And, and so while we're all, set, we're all saying foreclosure is the last thing in the world we want to do, I think we're sending a very mixed message when we're proceeding with foreclosure, uh, you know, actions while at the same time attempting to work on a modification. So I will just leave it at that and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. Um, I'm going to uh, ask a, a question uh, in the absence of the chairman. Uh, this program, HAMP, has been such a disappointment. Perhaps we had our hopes too high. but. Uh, to the credit of the administration, uh, it keeps trying. And here is a question about what would perhaps be e e e the most difficult aspect of the program, um, where Treasury announced the Home Affordable Unemployment Program uh, that uh, provides uh, three to six months forbearance to unemployed homeowners while they seek employment. Now, we understand that some companies uh, have uh, provided such forbearance um, to unemployed bar borrowers uh, before. I'm sure that in the normal course 
of downturns, for example, that was not unusual. Let me ask all of you, have uh, any of you, and tell me the extent to which any of you have uh, uh, participated in the uh, forbearance program, beginning with you, Mr. Doss. I mean, we launched the program, uh, we launched an unemployment assist program in March of 2009 when unemployment was rising and there wasn't a denominator to calculate debt to income ratios. But we kept it very simple. Uh, we support the Treasury's program, but I believe that um, the paperwork might be a little uh, more nuanced than one would have wanted. All we asked for uh, in our program was an unemployment um, document of proof of unemployment, and if it was an owner occupier, we just made it a simple payment of $500 a month for three months. We would have liked to have extended it to six months. But what it did was it paused the issue, the, the whole foreclosure process and the whole, you know, people missing payments process, and it enabled people to get into HEMP, which was a very, very powerful outcome for that program. So that was, so as a part, was this on your own or a part? This was on our own. And, um, and are you, you continuing know, it with this three to six month? Uh, forbearance? Absolutely. We're extending it to the new Treasury program, but we didn't wait for that. We started it on our own, and um, I'm delighted to see that the Treasury program is actually based on some of the, some of the attributes of what we did. Mr. Sir? Uh, yes, we have been doing forbearances for unemployed, and we will actively participate in the government's program, and we're looking at a no our own proprietary program that could potentially extend beyond the six months under certain circumstances just because of the length of unemployment for some of our customers. Mr. Friedman? Yeah, we have always had a forbearance for that particular reason prior to HAMP and, and post-HAMP as well uh, for three months. Um, I know that you are considering a, a longer situation. Um, that becomes very expensive for us as a servicer um, going forward because whether the, the borrower in our situation makes payments or not, we the servicer have to make those payments on behalf of the borrower to the investor. So anything longer than a three month period becomes very expensive for us. Mr. Hyde? We've done about 100,000 such customer cases before the HAMP modification was uh, changed. The Treasury program is very similar to the one we were offering before, so we're in the process of converting over, and we will continue to help customers mm -hmm. that don't qualify for HAMP as well. Mr. Lohman? We have always offered uh, forbearance to unemployed borrowers and will participate in the Treasury program. Mr. Pinto? What? Could I ask that uh, all of you uh, provide to the chairman uh, the number of homeowners uh, between, uh, beginning with the beginning of this year uh, that, um, to whom you have given forbearance? Um, I, I, I would, I, I understand that this of course is something that might have been routinely done before. You had a customer. It, it, it was the, the uh, um, appropriate thing to do under the circumstances. Of course, these circumstances are very different because there are higher levels of unemployment. Um, so I'd be interested in your candid view of how successful uh, forbearance has been in avoiding foreclosure. Does it just spread the time out or ha have, uh, what is your uh, view based on your own experience of whether this delay in foreclosure for an unemployment unemployed homeowner uh, what is your view of of its uh, success or its effect mr. Doss and congressman I believe that <clears throat> the idea of uh, delay is not as bad as it's made out to be uh, sometimes uh, oftentimes borrowers need a pause um, so that they can focus on getting the employment as opposed to also keeping their home at the same time. As I said to you before, the fact that unemployment assist allowed people to get into an alternative program like HAMP was a very powerful outcome, and I believe that that needs to be noted. Uh, I believe it's very dependent on the situation of the customer and the length of, of unemployment. And we recognize and that. I'm just 
and we recognize that I'm, and that's a, that, that's a vast, uh, vastly different universe out there. But I'm asking you a general question. Uh, certainly, uh, I I would believe that temporary relief from the obligations that a customer has would enable them to more successfully bridge the economic hardship that they're experiencing. Yes. Yeah, I would occur. I would concur with her assessment as well. Yeah, I agree. And I think the design of the program where there's some amount of cash flow every month is actually better for the customer mm -hmm. so that there's not such a huge shock three or four or five months down the line when income is restored. I concur also. If, if you're looking for quantitative information, you may want to, again, go to the OCC, OTS, uh, mortgage metrics and see if they have data that actually tracks the question you ask. I've not seen any, but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. I don't recall any. This is this is a rather much of a perfect storm we have, where um, unemployment meets uh, mortgage crisis. Uh, normally, unemployment doesn't meet that kind of crisis, uh, exacerbating uh, a situation of of people who have all along uh, kept up their uh, mortgage payments. Um, do you have, uh, uh, do, do, I recognize that you all want to do the right thing and to some extent you have been doing it. Uh, would you care to offer suggestions uh, as to this relatively new program, uh, uh, as to its structure and what might be done? For example, one of you, I'm not sure if it was you, Mr. L uh, Mr. Friedman, indicated that, or maybe it was you, Mr. Todd, indicated beyond three months. Uh, I'm not sure any of you do it beyond three months. But it created it created issues beyond three months. Um, yeah, it, it was I that said for since we're not part of a bank or, or have a deposit base uh, as the other folks around the table, other than maybe Mr. Pinto, unless he's wealthier than we all think. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, it we because we do a lot of securizations, we don't own uh, the loan outright. We have to make payments to the investors month in, month out, whether the borrower makes payments to us. So and that's not the case for anybody else sitting at the table. No, those same requirements apply to everybody. Yes. But I think the uh, the idea of the three month uh, allows multiple three month check ins. Where you really the, the purpose for that is to make sure you can stay current with what's going on with mm -hmm. the customer's life. You know, what are the prospects for them to get back to a level of employment? where the home is affordable. That's mm -hmm. kind of where the extensions of three months at a time comes into play. Mr. Desir, did you have? Yeah, no, I, w I would concur with that. Uh, the uh, chair has asked me to recess the hearing uh, for about a half hour uh, because there was at least one member who did not get an opportunity to ask questions. So this hearing is, don't go anywhere. This hearing is recessed. The committee will come to order and we will resume the uh, five minute questioning. Uh, and let me, let me begin uh, uh, with Mr. Hyde. Uh, uh, Mr. Hyde, according to the uh, uh, research done by the National Community Reinvestment Fund, minority borrowers are less likely than other borrowers to receive trial and permanent modifications. Uh, do you believe that this is an accurate assessment? Not, it's hard to answer that question. On the surface, I would say only if the home is not affordable would that be the case. There's nothing in the modification process that would cause a difference between ethnic backgrounds or anything of the sort. Well, Mr. Hyde, I asked the question because we know that um, prior to the modification phase that African American borrowers um, with comparable uh, uh, income and, and, and other considerations were steered into subprime and predatory loans. So, you know, they were disproportionately impacted by those policies. 
instead of them getting a conventional market, they were steered. And, and there's plenty of, plenty of data to, sh to show that. So, you know, since they were disproportionately affected by uh, being steered into these high cost loans, uh, I'm just curious as to what, what is happening to these, these minority borrowers now who are in trouble, who are trying to get their loans modified. Do you think maybe they're disproportionately being affected still? Well, Congressman, as far as the statement on steering, I disagree. As far as the loan modification process and how that works, oh, you disagree. We have the same process for. Wait a minute, you, what do you disagree about, as far as steering? What do you, what 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 do you find disagreeable about what I said? You're quoting a particular study, typically, and I believe that study in particular does a comparison with partial information on public data uh -huh. yeah, to but, try but, to get but, to. A but the numbers the numbers speak volumes. The numbers speak volumes about how uh, middle income, upper income, African American families were steered into subprime and predatory loan. Now you can sit here and deny that if you want, but it's happened. And and and, and let me say something else about Wells Fargo. You know, um, quite a few of my constituents have been impacted negatively uh, by this whole. Uh, mortgage meltdown uh, and we have gone to Wells Fargo my staff back in my district asking for you to modify some of these loans and we've heard every excuse like oh we've taken TARP money so it would be inappropriate uh, to try to help these people now uh, what do you have to say about that well, have you I'm used that excuse that you know because you're a recipient of TARP, that you cannot help these average Americans trying to stay in their homes? No, absolutely not. That's an absurd statement on anybody on our shop. On anyone in our shop that would have made a statement like that, that's absurd. Uh, it, what, we, what we are doing is this. Our, inform, our data kind of speaks for the efforts we're putting forth. Um, when you look at every customer, irrespective of ethnic background, every customer that has missed two or more payments in their mortgage status, two-thirds of the time we're finding a solution other than foreclosure. The loan modification process we put forth, uh, the people that are doing the work, most of them over the phone, have no ethnic information on the screens they're looking at, with the one exception of the HAMP program, requires voluntary submission of ethnic information. But even in HAMP, every single customer going through a modification process has a very prescribed series of steps that one goes through to gather income information, get them into a loan modification they're able to afford. That's the way the HAMP program works. The non-HAMP programs are set up in a very similar way so that every customer goes through the same process for loan modification. You know, I, I, I really find it incredulous that you don't think uh, that African-American borrowers were steered into these high-priced loans. I mean, I, I find it incredible. Let me ask the rest of the panel, uh, do they agree with Mr. Hyde or do you think that these people were di are disproportionately impacted uh, by racist policy. I'm going to start with you, Mr. Dobbs. Have you seen any evidence that the people were disproportionately impacted based on their race? Congressman Clay, I believe that you raise a very important point. Um, and I believe that in um, economic downturns, uh, that the hardship can be disproportionate uh, in minority communities. Mm -hmm. And here's what I would say. We don't do anything at city and that would pro that would distinguish between um, race, origin, sex, um, or any of the any of the any of those um, those factors. But I here's what I would say. Mm -hmm. I think that hemp needs to be enhanced for low to moderate income communities in a very different way to the way it's been established today. And I believe that some of my colleagues have said, have taken a similar position. Thank you for that response. Uh, Ms. Do Dosar. Uh, Dosar, thank you, um, Congressman Clay. The uh, uh, Bank of America did not 
uh, we exited the subprime business in the year 2000. We acquired Countrywide in 2008. Shortly after the acquisition, we entered into a settlement that we're executing with 44 states, which is our national, our proprietary national home retention program, which was intentionally targeted at pay option arms, subprime hybrid arms, products that uh, might have created the most stress in these economic times for borrowers. And we follow uh, uh, a very deliberate process of uh, much of which is automated, treating equally uh, the attempts to outreach to all of our customers as well as our, our response to customers who are calling us because they're under financial stress. And then intentionally, um, we did six hundred. We participated in 360 community events last year. Again, we've stepped up that number even more this year. Uh, we've invested in uh, the Alliance for Stabilizing Communities where disproportionately we go to and participate in events where the communities are the hardest uh, hit so we can provide face-to-face -face, uh, uh, counseling and acceptance of applications and modifications as well. And, and so you do. Uh, Bank of America has, has admitted that they are that that there has been steering that there has that, that you see disproportionate effects uh to that uh you you know i believe in the adage uh that figures don't lie but liars sure can figure and 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 this is a good example of that that you know this part this segment of the population was disproportionately impacted because of the actions of the banking community, because you do have a human factor involved here. You do have loan officers that look at customers differently based on their skin color. That's all I'm saying, but for you, for people to come here and deny that, uh, I think it's wrong and the American people can see through that. Mr. Freeman. Um. <clears throat> Fortunately, we didn't originate any loans, so uh, personally, I'm a little out of touch on, on that particular subject, but I do believe we, like, like Bank of America and others, um, do go to a lot of outreach programs. Uh, I think a good help for the community would possibly, again, bring down the uh, debt-to-income test uh, to you know, even lower than 31% under HAMP, which maybe, you know, if there was some type of injustice done, maybe it could help that many more people. I mean, that's just as a suggestion. Have, have any of your institutions created programs that target uh, particularly at-risk groups like racial minorities and the unemployed uh, who have been adversely impacted? I mean, I don't, I don't know why you, you couldn't do such a program. I mean, again, we don't, yeah, we don't, we don't originate, so I can't sure. really comment on that. Okay. Mr. Lohman, any comments? I would just add that, you know, at Chase, um, we have a culture of fair lending and have always had that culture of fair lending. Um, we've done our own analysis uh, based on the um, report that you referred to, the NCRC study, and um, our findings are not congruent with their findings. Uh, we have done over 700 outreach uh, events uh, throughout the country. We have 51 home ownership centers uh, throughout the country in the most troubled of neighborhoods where uh, you know, we continue to do outreach and, and, and I think you know, really uh, are able to serve the underserved. Okay, so uh, I, I mean look, the facts speak for themselves. You go to a predominantly African American neighborhood where you have where every third house is foreclosed. I mean, doesn't that doesn't that stand out and say something to you that perhaps those communities have been targeted? It, I, okay, they, I can't speak doesn't. to the facts. I, I I can't speak to it. Uh, Mr. Pinto, anything to add? I'm not being a lent. Not being a lender, I, I really have no information to add. Just as an observer? As an observer, and, and I think this is um, 
uh, blame is, is placed on both sides of the aisle here, so let me start with that. Uh, lenders and Fannie and Freddie back in 1991 had very sound underwriting principles. Mm -hmm. Those underwriting principles were complained about by community groups. They went to Congress in 1991 and petitioned Congress to change that. Uh, what they asked, what they said was that lenders respond to the most conservative standards unless Fannie and Freddie become aggressive and convincing in their efforts to expand historically narrow underwriting, change their underwriting. And that was before the U.S. Senate Banking, uh, Housing and Urban Affairs Committee in 1991. In 1992, the uh, uh, Federal Housing Enterprises Safety and Soundness Act made that request into the law of the land. And from that point on, the underwriting standards of this country changed step by step by step. Eventually, we went from having down payments on loans uh -huh. to having no down payments sure. on loans. It was the result of a policy that Congress put in place, bipartisan policy that Congress put in place. That's where it started, and that's my view. And, uh, but, but that wasn't totally uh, the reasoning. For for this housing collapse, I mean, I mean just Franny and Freddie are to, to blame, not the people that every step of the way made money off of these loans and these high cost loans. Remember, we don't what, just stop what Fannie and Freddie do it. Remember what they were asking for. We want to break the lenders' view of having conservative underwriting, and the only way to do that was to get Fannie and Freddie to start. Uh, having flexible underwriting, which they did starting in 1993. And it just progressed. And, and I, it and, was a progression and, that occurred over 15 years. And like you said, there's enough blame to go around. I guess we, we probably should look at what the appraisers did too, and, shouldn't we? Don't get me started on appraisers. OK, <laughs> all right. Well, I thank you all for your responses. And uh, at this point, that concludes this, this hearing. Uh, and it, without. Uh, Reserving the right to object, the record shall be left open for seven days so that members may submit information for the record. Finally, without objection, uh, I will enter this binder of hearing documents and statements submitted by interested party for the committee record, and the committee stands adjourned. Coming up on C-SPAN, President Obama comments on the financial regulations bill. And then a part of the House Senate conference session where that bill was crafted. And we'll get analysis of the bill from Bloomberg News reporter Yalman Onoran. 